Hello, it's Philip Taylor speaking from Richmond Green Chambers in London and this morning I'm looking at a book which has come to us from Cambridge University Press. The title is Experiments in International Adjudication, Historical Accounts and it's been edited with contributors by basically two people, Ignacio de la Rosilla and Jorge E. Vinules. I hope I pronounced your names correctly, gentlemen. I'm sorry if I've got it wrong. <laughs> this book is a first-class book, and I was very impressed with it when I saw the actual information about it, and now I've actually been able to review the book. I've given it a title, A Useful Purchase for All International Adjudicators, published recently by Cambridge University Press. And, of course, can I just say we're very lucky to Cambridge University uh, press. We're very lucky that they produce these works because they really do make our lives a lot easier in trying to understand where we are. And in this case, it's dealing with um, what is actually now an international subject uh, of, in this case, adjudication. I am, as well as a barrister at law, um, an accredited mediator. And that, of course, is not just confined to England and Wales, which the bar is for me, uh, but I'm international when it comes to the, this type of dispute resolution. Let's have a look at the book first of all. Here it is. Very nice front cover. Um, there we go. You can see the side of the book there. And then there's the uh, back of the book. Uh, so you get some idea of exactly what it is. Um, this is actually a hardback book as you can see. Uh, it runs to something approaching 320 odd pages. The actual index at the back is by page numbering. You know sometimes they can be by paragraph numbering. In this case it's page numbering because when you look at the, uh, uh, the actual book itself you can see there are footnotes but there's no paragraph numbering. You can see the detailed footnotes at the bottom. A tip, by the way, with footnotes, it's always probably a good idea not to be bothered too much with the footnotes. Concentrate on the main, um, the main uh, body copy, first of all. There's some detail about the book, which I shall refer to again in a minute, and so I shall quote a bit from uh, that blurb. There's the front page there, and then we've got the actual details from CUP. Then you've got the actual... A content section. Uh, you've also got, it, it runs to 13 chapters in total. Let me just give you the part numbers. Part one is international adjudication and ever-present history because things are changing dramatically at the moment in this area. Part two, experiments in dispute specific adjudication. And it's looking at particular parts of the world because this is an international book. I think that will be of help to many people depending on the jurisdiction where you have your dispute resolution. Part three, uh, content-specific redress mechanisms. Part four, the quest for a permanent court. Obviously, we don't have that at the moment. Uh, and five, experiments in specialised courts. And that's actually looking at the European Court of Human Rights as one of the courts. Then you've got the list of contributors, quite a large number of people. Uh, I can't go through all of the names, sadly, because there are a lot of people mentioned. Then there are some acknowledgements. Then we have an introduction from the two editors setting the scene. It says, the post-Cold War era has been called the age of international adjudication on account of the multiplication of international courts and tribunals and the rise of a plethora of other international adjudicatory and quasi-adjudicatory bodies. That gives you some idea of where we're moving. I mean, we're talking now of some considerable time since the end of World War II. We've just celebrated the 75th anniversary of D-Day. Next year, 2020, will of course be the 75th anniversary of the end of the war. So you can see that um, very, very many things have changed. The book itself, you can see in the middle of it, it's got a lot of footnoting and uh, a lot of detail. It's a... Uh, it's not the easiest book in the world to read, but I think it's very important. So what do we say about the book? Well, this. This form of dispute resolution, that is um, adjudication, remains the current flavour of the month, both nationally and internationally, as we review the way we adjudicate disputes in, in the 21st century. The editors... Um, Ignacio de la Rosilla and Jorge y e. uh, Venules have brought together expert contributors to give an interesting perspective, in our view, 
to the complex subject of adjudication, which I think is often, frankly, misunderstood. As I say, I'm a mediator, and it is part and parcel of dispute resolution, but I'm still quite clear in my mind that there's out there, even with the general public, and, and of course corporates and everybody else, there is a bit of a misunderstanding about exactly what we do. And I think this book will redress the balance. CUP, the Cambridge University Press, I think are to be congratulated as one of the forerunners of these excellent and detailed views which they're putting forward on where we are with adjudication today. Uh, as a possibly, it's not really a new form of dispute, but it's a form of dispute resolution which has come very much to the fore, uh, and rightly too. The government certainly in the United Kingdom sees it that way, and I know internationally they do too. Now, as the editors say, quote, the history of international adjudication is all too often presented as a triumphalist narrative of normative and institutional progress that casts aside its uncomfortable memories, its darker legacies, and its historical failures. Now, that is, I think, a f I think it sounds a little bit pompous, but that is a very fair statement about the fact that there have been problems. I, I know of many people who are not very happy about this sort of way of resolving a dispute, but you understand um, that, in fact, this is actually the future. Now, in the book itself, this one here, the hardback, the two editors describe the bulk of trial trials and errors as being left in the dark, as they say, quote, confined to oblivion or left for erudition to recall as a curiosity. Now, obviously, I think that's a little bit emotive to a certain extent, but the fact is that we are we are moving into new territory. And as we say, it's an interesting perspective, which is basically continued throughout the work. The title, of course, has been written by an interdisciplinary group of lawyers, historians and social scientists. And this volume, of course, relies on the rich and largely unexplored archive of institutional and legal experimentation since the late 19th century, which, and I think, does shed some new light on the history of international adjudication. And this is the right time for it, because we are actually now looking at um, the world and our country as part of the world in its global context, really very much for the first time. And that's actually down to the new technology, uh, the internet, of course, the way we communicate, the most devastating changes since the introduction of the printing press in Caxton's era. Now, the aim, of course, throughout, I think, by the editors, has been to combine contextual accounts of failed or aborted, as well as of successful experiments, to clarify our understanding of the past and present of international adjudication. Because, let's face it, it hasn't sometimes worked in the past, but it's with us. Um, I'm not <clears throat> going too far back when I say that with Nuremberg in particular, that set a trend. And since then, there were a lot of things that wanted to be that we wanted to do even then, which we weren't able to do. And I think very slowly we are moving towards an era where there's going to be a lot more international adjudication. Uh, obviously, we've got in the difficulties with things like Brexit and the structure of the European Union, where the aim had been to, to, to try to get a more standardised approach to laws. But in the general run of things, we are looking now at uh, the international community and, and how they're going to deal with some form of dispute resolution. Now, the work covers most of the useful areas of, adjudication, uh, of adjudicators and of dispute resolvers. And it offers what the editors call an accessible entry point <coughs> to several experiments in international adjudication, and it revisits forgotten or understudied institutional experiments, of which there are quite a few, and the trials and the errors which I've referred to, rather than the success stories of international adjudication, are the ones that they're looking at in particular. And the two editors have considered the following points particularly, which I think readers will find helpful. An examination of experiments in a specific context which shows that the roots of several uh, major developments are to be found in some of the more little-known experiments, and also they give us a contribution to the growing body of research on the history of international adjudication itself, and more broadly, the history of international law, which is not as closely studied today 
perhaps I think in my submission as it might be, put it as, as quietly as that. I do think both in terms of comparative law and also international law, we've We've still got a little way to go because we can learn a great deal, even though we created in England and Wales the greatest legal system the world's seen, and that is the common law. Now, I know that's an understatement, but uh, there we go. That's my view. <laughs> can I thank everybody concerned with the production of this book? It was first published as a hard book by CUP on the 28th of March 2019. Let's just have one look at it again. There it is, the front, the spine, and then the back. Um, just opening it in the middle, you can see um, this is the, the way that the chapters are structured. Let me just show you this. This is chapter 10. There we go. That The title there is Rise and Fall, uh, sorry, First to Rise and First to Fall, The Court of Katoga, 1907-1918, and written by um, Freya Bartons. And you can see the, the way it's structured. You've got the name of the author, then you've got the, and, and some detail about, about it there. You've then got all of the main detail. And then at the back of the chapter, you've got a little bibliography as well. And normally you will have some sort of, sometimes some sort of conclusion. I'd like to thank everybody, as I say, very much for the book. It was a fascinating book for me to look at. Um, my mediation practice is just growing at the moment. And therefore I found it a very useful book to look at. Thank you to all. Bye-bye.